think we're good, Joe. So, yeah. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode four of Front Row Seat. Thanks for joining us today for our fourth live interview. As you know, my name is Dylan Dems, and this is my co-host, Joey Schwartz. Before we get to our amazing guest tonight, we are proud partners with the Detroit Children's Fund. We really encourage everyone to make a donation to DCF. You can find the link on our website, www.frontrowseatlive.com. All proceeds will go directly to purchasing tablets or computers for kids in the Detroit public schools. All donations are greatly ap appreciated. Please, please, please donate. We are extremely lucky to have Tracy Wolfson, a four-time Emmy nominee, CBS sports lead reporter for the NFL, NBA, and NCAA, and the host of the CBS sports show, We Need to Talk. Thank you so much for being here tonight. So, so 2020 has been quite a different year for all of us with COVID canceling all sports events and the unfortunate events of the past few weeks. We are hoping sports can be one way to help make the rest of the year better. So how are you and how has your quarantine been with uh, you and your family? Well, I, uh, I'm doing good. I'm quarantined with my three boys and my husband is working from home. So it's a little different. I've become basically a teacher, a chef, a housekeeper, a uh, camp counselor, basically. Um, it was a little weird because I was getting ready to you know, broadcast March Madness. And, you know, I had just done a few basketball games leading up to it. And we were like, will we get to the Big Ten tournament? Will we not? And that's one of my favorite events. And, you know, it was a really unsettling time. And then when we got the call that it was going to be canceled, I think there was a little bit of sigh of relief, though, because you didn't know there was so much uncertainty going into it. But it's been strange. Um, I've been working probably more so now than I would have after the tournament. Usually this is my off time. Mm -hmm. And CBS is, is getting some programming and needs to have some programs to put out there. So I've been doing a few shows here and there. And then we're taping our We Need to Talk show that you mentioned um, that will be on and we'll do that virtually as well. And so I'm um, doing a bunch of Zooms and keeping busy, but really hoping that football returns in the fall. Yeah. So we hope <laughs> So you have the dream job of so many kids, well, at least Joey and I. When did you decide that you would go into sports reporting? Yeah, I was uh, really young. I was about seven, eight, nine years old, and I was a little tomboy, and I absolutely loved sports. And I watched a show as I was growing up, the NBA Inside Stuff, which is now on, uh, I think, TNT. But back then it was on with Ahmad Rashad, who you guys all know now from The Last Dance, and Willow Bay, who was featured in The Last Dance also. And I looked up to Willow Bay and I said, you know what? She knows sports, she's talking sports. That's what I wanna do. And literally from that moment, it was kind of my dream job, like you said. And you know, it's really difficult to achieve that goal necessarily. So I knew no matter what, I wanted to get into sports and talk sports. And if not, just be involved in the field of sports. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I was able to actually achieve that dream of mine. Did you play sports when you were younger? Yeah, so when I was younger, I played everything. I was a huge basketball fan, but I stopped growing basically in sixth grade and I'm all a 5'2". And so I, uh, that, I had to give that dream up. But I was a tennis player since I was really young and that was my main sport. Almost went to try and play in college, but really wanted to be surrounded by big time sports because of my passion and love and thought it would help me get to where I was. So that's why I, uh, I chose to go to Michigan. So Dylan and I are going to college in a year and we want to know what aspects of college at the University of Michigan prepared you for sports media? Yeah, I think, you know, to be honest, when I was there during my junior year, they actually closed down the journalism department. And so I had no classes I can take to prepare me for broadcast journalism. And I had no one to look to because there were very few women in the field. I didn't know anyone in the field. And so you know, I took a few English classes. I thought maybe writing would help, but really it was the hands-on opportunities that got me the experience. So I did get an internship through the communications department at HBO Sports. I met a lot of people there. And when I went back for my senior year, they said, hey, you know, why don't you come and be a runner for us and work college football games and work the college basketball games. And I wound up doing figure skating at the Palace of Auburn Hills. And I went up to Grand Rapids and did a figure skating show. And I got as much hands-on experience as I could 
I think there's a lot of WOLV TV that's on the campus of the University of Michigan is a really great opportunity. I see a lot of young men and women coming out of there with a lot of experience. And then I think there's also, you know, the Big Ten Student Union, Student U, they call it, has a really big presence there as well. There's a lot more opportunities now than when I was there. But I would tell anyone, and everyone would say to me, hey, should I go to a school that has journalism in it? To be honest, as long as you're around sports, you're talking sports, and you're making the most of the opportunities and you're putting yourself out there and doing things like you guys are doing right now, then I think you will get enough of the education to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. So with the MBA resuming on July 31st, me and Joey can't be more excited. <laughs> are you going to be there? No, I am, I am not going to be there. I don't cover the NBA anymore. I loved my time covering the NBA. I, uh, I did it for a while and I did basically play off basketball because the NBA coincided with college basketball and football season. And so I could never really do regular season, but I worked for Turner in the playoffs after college basketball was over and I loved it. But, you know, one of the biggest things about being a reporter is juggling and, and being a mom is juggling both of those things. And it was really difficult for me to leave another three, four weeks after I had just been gone for so long. And then I wouldn't get home to see my kids really as much as I wanted to till basically the end of May. And so I had to make a life decision where I was where I was and happy where I was at CBS and doing what I was doing that I wound up giving up the NBA. And I like to now just sit back and be a fan. So I, I certainly will be watching. Are you a fan of the new format for the playoffs? I, I think it'll be cool. You know, any way to get, you know, pro sports, college, right. obviously not college yet, but pro sports back on the air for people to watch, to provide entertainment, to provide a distraction. I think it's great. I really hope it works. I know all eyes. I'm sure the ratings will be through the roof yeah. and especially because you won't have fans there. And so I think it'll be, I think it'll be really interesting to see. And hopefully a lot of the sports follow suit. And fortunately for us and for the NFL, there's a little time they can actually watch and say, Hey, you know, what is the NBA doing? How is this working? And are they able to make sure that, you know, COVID doesn't come back during all of this and then they can take what they're learning and implement it into the NFL. Yeah. I think the views for all sports uh, will go up. With yeah. No yeah. doubt. Yeah. We're, we're all missing it so much. We need that distraction. Yeah. And I mean, I'm excited even for golf to come back this weekend. You know. Will the reporters be allowed to talk to the players and the coaches during the games in Orlando? You know, it's a really great question. I don't know the answer to that. I would be pretty surprised. I, I think this is only me talking and it's just speculation and right. I haven't spoken to anyone. But as a reporter, I would think that's probably going to go away right now. It's very difficult to, to stand six feet away and do an interview. And maybe you both have to be masked up. And right. it just doesn't seem what they could really do is just put a headset on a guy and have him do the interview through up to the booth. I mean, they do that all the time with, mm -hmm. with games that don't have reporters there. But I think a reporter is really necessary in terms of it's a news story also it's not just a sports story now so right. they're going to need a presence there to to give the information and the injuries and what's happening going in and did someone get you know you know tested and are they positive and what happens then and of course all with you know everything going on with the protests at least you know that's going to be a news story as well and so i think there needs to be reporters out there reporting the stories they might just not be on the court or doing interviews but i think they will be there and certainly have a presence. But I wouldn't be surprised, by the way, if they have announcers calling games from New York. You, mm -hmm. you can feasibly watch a game on a television and call it. Yeah. You can't be a reporter in New York and right. report on the game. Yeah. That's very difficult. It's not the same. So with the NFL, because it's supposed to start on time um, with no fans, what are your thoughts on uh, their format? What do you think about it? I think right now it looks as though they're business as usual. I think they don't have, they have the luxury of time right now. So they can wait and see, and they don't have to make any adjustment adjustments, but I am sure that they're sitting there right now and going through all the different scenarios. And Hey, what if we have to start a few weeks later? And what if we have to stop in the middle of the season? Or what if we have to push it to November and what happens to the Super Bowl, and how far can we push that? I think they're coming up with all scenarios right now with or without fans yeah. so that they are prepared. And you know, I haven't spoken to CBS about it because we don't need to yet, but I'm sure they're coming up and all the networks are coming up with their scenarios of how are we going to produce this and 
will we have, you know, announcers on site and what are the production trucks going to look like? Cause you're on top of each other when you're producing a game, you know, you're screaming, you're spitting, you're yelling, you're loud, you know, everyone's touching everything, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be different too. And, and all the stadiums and the NFL, they have to deal with how do we take tickets and how do we allow, if we do have fans, do you make it every other seat? Do you allow certain ticket holders to come one game and not the other game? There's so many scenarios that I'm sure they are spending their time on trying to figure out how we can make this work because everyone wants to make it work. Definitely. Do you think the players uh, will like the, the new format, whatever they? I think the players want to get back out and play no matter what. I think it's going to be difficult to play in front of, to, in an empty stadium, if that's the case. There's very different things that happen. First of all, as a reporter, you hear everything. And as now players, you're going to hear everything. Yeah. And even your huddles are going to be louder than normal. I mean, there's nothing to drown it out the broadcast is going to sound differently. Do you put music behind it? Do you put crowd noise behind it? You know, it's going to be very interesting to play in front. And then the home field advantage is gone. I heard a lot of different scenarios on the NBA. Do you put, you know, what about those teams that deserve home court advantage aren't really getting home court advantage? How do you make it so that they kind of do get that? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, home field versus away is going to be tough in the NFL if there's no, you know, fans in the stadiums, but I think they're willing to work through it. I think different sports have different challenges when it comes to that. I think for the NFL, I think for the NBA, I think they just want to get back and play. For the NBA, I heard, not from a reliable source, but I heard that they might, the teams might bring their own like hardwood. Sure. Yeah. I heard the same thing. And, mm -hmm. and you know what? That's interesting. I thought even just putting the logos of right. the team that has the home court. Okay. That's good, but you don't want to do too much because then you skew it a little bit, right? Then that's not fair either. I heard little things of giving, you know, those fans an extra, you know, you can get an extra foul on one of the players. I mean, those teams, the home home court team yeah. or, you know, an extra timeout or an extra, to me, that just changes the game and that's unfair. Mm -hmm. But, you know, bringing in your court or putting the logo down, that's all right. Yeah. So the NFL has become amazing on TV with the, in the past few years with, red zone and cbs what but now because of the pandemic do you think this will affect fans wanting to go to the games in the future you know it's a good question i think look i think once there's a vaccine i think we'll somewhat get back to normal people feel comfortable i think the viewing is going to be different i think stadiums are going to be different i think you know taking tickets will be different it'll be all virtual i think maybe spacing will be different if they can if they when they start building new stadiums um, I don't know. I mean, I love going to a game as a fan. I love tailgating college. I mean, that's what you do, right? Yeah. You can't take that away. So I don't know. I mean, I drive into, you know, when I worked in the sec or whether I, I do an NFL game. I mean, that's part of the experience yeah. and I would hate to see that gone. Yeah. So I, I really hope they can find a way to adjust and get back to normal eventually, but this is a time of transition right now. Yeah. So I know that NFL players, they're already mic'd up during the games, but do you think there'll be more of that during the season? Yeah. So, you know what? We don't mic up players during our CBS games unless um, when we did Thursday night, we did. A lot of teams do it. A lot of teams don't. Players don't. You have to pick the right player. Otherwise, it's not worth it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of restrictions. The NFL has a representative that sits in a truck with you and says, you know what? You can't air that. You can't air that mm -hmm. because they don't want you know, certain bits of information getting out there, rightfully so. And so as we saw with the Sam Darnold and seeing ghosts out there, right? When he yeah. said that, I mean, look at the, that just took on a whole story of its own. So, but I do think that they have to come up with creative ways to change the game if there are no fans there and bring the viewer, you know, closer in. And I think that is one way that they can do that. And maybe, Maybe the, the NFL will be a little bit more lenient with that. And maybe the players will be more resp respect, you know, ha they'll, they'll be fine with having a, a mic on them. A lot of players right now don't like that, but maybe they'll be open to it because it'll just give a different perspective in these times. And also, I think they're definitely going to put like sound effects or any sort in the, in the, uh, for every stadium. Yeah, they're going to have to do something. I, I think some crowd noise that the production trucks will probably <laughs> put out there yeah. kind of makes sense. I don't know what they'll do in the stadiums because piping and noise, I mean, how do you, you have to adjust a level. You have to make sure it's not unfair for the other team. And so that should be interesting too. There's a lot to figure out. I'm sure they're spending a lot of time though, you know, going through every scenario. Yeah. So for this next question, 
we have a like short video clip that we want to show you before we ask you this question. Uh oh. So here we go. A tremendous effort by your defense, but that one drive to put it away with your trusty guys of yeah. Rob Gronkowski and Julian Edelman, and then Sonny Michelle punches it yeah. in to be, make the difference. Everyone's talking that this dynasty was declining. How yeah. satisfying after all the talk, yeah. and this season was this one. Yeah. So with that, Sports Illustrated named you the real MVP of the Super Bowl because of that interview with Tom. So tell us about that interview because when we saw it, we were scared for you with how many people there were <laughs> crowding around you. All right. Well, first off, I haven't actually ever watched that, believe it or not. Really? So I never wow. went back because really it was such a surreal, weird thing that happened. I did not realize that everyone from on TV was watching it and was watching the whole scene happen and unfold. I didn't realize they were on me the whole time. And so I think I had this vision of like how it turned out and I didn't want to go back and, and watch it and not feel like, cause I judge myself like really, you know, oh, I didn't like it or I should have said this, or I should have said that. So I just kind of never watched it. And that's the first time actually I've seen that, believe it or not. So that kind of gave me chills and I'm like a little nervous right now, believe it. But um, I will say it was weird. So. I did not feel scared at all for one moment. Mm -hmm. I went through the SEC and that was the scene and so many games I had mm -hmm. because, and you have fans normally, you know, storming the field in those games. So if you remember the kick six from Auburn, Alabama, mm -hmm. where they just storm the field and I, there was a guy in a shoulder and I'm pulling him down and everyone's like trying to protect themselves and there's no one protecting you in there. It kind of prepared me for those moments and basically this is how it is. Like, you know, you're going to get Tom Brady at the end of the game mm -hmm. and you are standing there and you are waiting and I have a beeline and I see him and I watch him and I know the security guard guy that who is alongside him. And so I am taking off immediately and getting next to him to make sure that I am there when the moment's going to happen. And so I did that and I had him right away. Yeah. He just didn't want to he didn't want to talk. He just wanted to go and kiss and hug everyone, you know, and congratulate. And I know Tom really well. Like I've covered him for a long time. We have a very good relationship. We have the Michigan connection. And so it had nothing to do with me. He just really wanted to celebrate. And I think if you put Jared Goff in that situation, that interview would have happened like that. Yeah. But the moment that it was Tom Brady, you know, winning another Super Bowl. And in reality, no one was for sure that that was his not going to be his last Super Bowl, that that scene happened. And so I was never scared, but everyone felt, you know, that, you know, I was, I, I was going to get hurt and, and they were all worried for my safety. I was just kind of doing my job. And to be honest, I was just waiting and waiting and waiting. And I'm like, okay, there'll be a time when I'm going to do this interview. I'm just going to be ready for it. And I think that's what it has to come down to, a little bit of patience and just ready for that moment. Never did I imagine it would, you know, occur that way. And the funny story afterwards is I'm, you know, so it ends and I'm thinking, oh, you know, like that was just nor almost normal. I didn't realize how long it took. I, I was so focused on my job and I go and I leave and I'm like, I go interview Gronk on the, and then I go interview Josh McDaniels. And then I'm like heading to the losing locker room to go do some interviews with them. And I hear, like, I get a call, like tons of calls on my phone and people texting me like, oh my God, that was, I had no idea what was happening. I didn't know they were showing this, right. you know? And my, my like production people, basically my uh, PR department was like, get back to the trucks immediately. We need to have a conversation. There's, inter you know, news people and uh, newspapers and magazine writers and beat writers and they all want to interview you. And I'm like, what? Like, I had no idea I was taking it to the next level. So I laugh it off. It was just one of the moments that I just said, I was just kind of like doing my job, really. And, um, but I certainly will remember that one for a long time. Did you ever know Tom when you both were in college? At I did not. I did not. But obviously was a big fan. Yeah. Um, but I didn't get a chance to meet him really until I started covering him in the NFL. But immediately it was go blue, you know? Yeah. What do you think about his move to Tampa Bay? 
I, I'm actually, I was very surprised. That was not the team I thought he would wind up with. I was all thinking it was going to be Tennessee. To me, playing for Mike Vrabel, having a, t- a defense around him, mm-hmm. having offensive, you know, playmakers around him, having an, a line, having, you know, being in Nashville, which is a great place to live. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it just made sense. And so I was really shocked. Um, but you know what? You never know with him. I feel like he's got this plan and, and he, I, he's excited about starting something. And I think he needed a change. He really did. You know, and I think he, he maybe wasn't having fun anymore. I think he wanted a challenge and he wanted a new, um, you know, a new environment. And now he's got Gronk with him and yeah. he's got a tremendous coach. And um, it'll be very interesting because we have the Super Bowl this year and it's in Tampa Bay. So that'll be, yeah, interesting to see if they could be the first team to wind up in the Super Bowl from their uh, home city. Yeah, I hope so. It could be his uh, last. Or did he sign? I don't know if he signed a two-year extension. I but. think it's probably a one year for now. I don't know either. Yeah. But are you guys Tom Brady fans? I am. Go blue, you know. Yeah, of course, exactly. So let's switch over to another great quarterback, Drew Brees. Do you think the sports world will accept Drew Brees' apology after what he said regarding the national anthem? Yeah, I do. I I don't want to get too into this. I'm going to, you know, look, he said what he said and he apologized and I want to stay out of the politics and everything with that. But um, I know him as a person and I've had a great chance to work alongside him and he's always been really good to me. And, um, you know, look, I, I think he did what he did. He said what he said and he apologized. And um, I, I think they'll figure it out inside the locker room. Let yeah. me, let me, let me answer it that way. Same with me. I think that his friends and teammates will get like brush it off. Yeah. Get back on it. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a lot of serious conversations they have to have amongst each other. And I think that's important. Right. right. And it's just like any team. And so uh but that's what I love about sports. And that's what I love about the NFL. And you saw, you know, what the players put together and how the NFL has responded. Um, and from those, vi- that video and right away. And, you know, I, I love the platform that sports has. And I love, you know, sports players are role models and young, not only young kids, but even adults, they look up to these athletes and they have a really good platform. And let's use this platform to make change. Yeah. And I think that's what they're doing. And I look forward to seeing what else the NFL is going to do and what these athletes are going to do when they get back on the field to help make a change. And hopefully this is a change that could, could finally last. Yeah, me too. All right. So next we have the front row seat quick fire questions. We'll ask you a couple of questions and just say whatever comes to your mind. Okay. First one we got is who is the toughest coach to interview and why? Bill Belichick, no doubt. I mean, it is like, here's how it goes, okay? I go up in the middle of a, at halftime, it's not on camera, and I'm like, you know, so Tom Brady got sacked four times in the first half, how are you gonna protect him better? And I basically get this. <laughs> I'm not- no, no, in like last, like another like minute. And I'm like, okay, do I ask another question? Right. Do I take him and walk away? Do I wait? It is so uncomfortable. It's like, I've been doing this for 16 years. Like I should like, I have like butterflies still in my stomach when I interview it. It's like the strangest thing. And he just looks at me. And then finally he's like, just got to do a better job. (laughs) I'm like, all right, like how? How do you do a better, just got to do a better job. And so, I mean, I think we've warmed up to each other over the years, but he Mm -hmm. is definitely uh, the most tight-lipped, difficult coach for me to interview. So who has been the hardest athlete that you've had to interview? Hmm. That's a great question. Honestly, they're, they're all pretty good. You know, I mean, if they're going to do an interview and you know, going in, you're not going to interview someone who's not going to do, um, not going to do an interview. We had a really tough interview with Todd Gurley actually at the Super Bowl, uh, mm-hmm. that Super Bowl that you, you after the game, uh, before the game, we, we meet, players you know we do a production meeting and we always bring in the star players and the quarterback and the coordinators and we brought in Gurley uh, because there was a lot of talk about his knee and we asked him the tough questions that's what we have to do we have to find the stories out we're going into the Super Bowl we need to know answers and understandable that he doesn't want to you know really give too much but uh he was not into it at all and he was really difficult but that's what happens and once you have a player 
who's not interested in, in doing these interviews, you never wind up interviewing them again. Mm -hmm. So who are your favorite teams besides, of course, Michigan? So I grew up a Jets fan, struggling Jets fan. Uh, maybe now that Brady is out of New England, maybe we have a little bit of a chance, right? Yeah. Um, so there, that's basically my team. I'm a Yankee fan when it comes to baseball, although I don't, I'm not as big a baseball fan as I used to be because I don't have the time to really spend right. watching it. Mm -hmm. um, but I am, I am still a huge Yankees fan. And, um, and it's Michigan. It is, I am a big college football fan. I absolutely love watching college football. And so I, it's hard to root when you cover teams for a living. So in the NFL, it's hard to root for the Jets because I kind of, you know, it, you have to be unbiased, first of all, but you also kind of root, it's funny, I'm like, okay, which stadiums do you like better? Which hotels do you like better? How are you going to get home at night? Like, are you going to be able to get there in time? You know, all these little things that you don't think about until you're actually in this business. Mm -hmm. uh, what cities do you like to be at? You know, what restaurants do you like to go to? That's how I wind up rooting. And then what teams are really good to work with? If you have a team that, you, you know, aren't, aren't easy or you don't have good relationships with, you kind of want to work with the teams that you do. So you tend up rooting, you tend to root that way. Um, and then, you know, I, even though I have to cover Michigan when I'm covering college basketball, not easy, certainly. Um, but it, it's just a little easier because, you know, with college, everyone's a fan, you know, and, and it's okay to like, everyone knows that I'm a Michigan fan when I cover University of Michigan. And I just have to try and hide it. Not easy though. Are you Knicks or Nets? I'm a Knicks fan, but I mean, they're so bad. And so, you know what? It's like, I've kind of become just an NBA fan mm -hmm. and I just like players and I like just watching the games. And you know what? It's the sad thing is my kids are like that now too, because they, the Knicks aren't good. So they haven't become Knicks fans and you don't want to go to games. And I really hope it gets back to that, but that's, I don't know. Maybe you guys can answer this better. My kids tend to like players. They play mm -hmm. fantasy football, yeah. you know, they play yeah. fantasy basketball. So they tend to just root for their players and those are the teams that they want to see win. So they don't really have that die hard, you know, they're not Jets fans because I grew up a Jets fan or my husband grew up a Jets fan. They just really like their players and the teams that they play for. It's different for, it's different for football because for fantasy football, I care about the players, but for basketball, I care about the teams. But. Are you Pistons fans, both of you? Yeah. It's hard, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's hard. And right now, are you guys, um, are you Lions fans too, though? Yeah. All right. So do you like interviewing on the court or on the field better? Oh, great question. Um, I think I like interviewing on the field. First of all, football in general is just, it's a longer game. It gives you more opportunity to get on the air, to unfold stories, to talk about things, to really get deep into it. Mm -hmm. Basketball goes by so quick. You don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And... I feel like, you know, there's a lot of different angles to football. There's a lot of, I don't know, there's just more players to talk about it. It just, it gives you more of an opportunity to do different interviews. Um, and basketball for me is, it's very different because I do March Madness as opposed to regular season games. And March Madness, everything's on the line. Mm -hmm. So everyone asks me, what do you like better? Do you like the NFL or you like college basketball? And I say, I love regular season NFL. I love postseason basketball March Madness. There is absolutely nothing like the yeah. NCAA tournament. Um, but in terms of interviewing, it's probably got to be um, an NFL game, uh, no doubt. And, and to be honest, going back to my roots of the SEC, I actually like that the best. Covering the really? SEC on college football and doing those interviews with like Nick Saban at half. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, it was not easy, but it was so fun. So the last quick fire question we have is, who are your mentors who have helped you along the way? It's a really good question because I had no mentors growing up because I didn't know anyone mm -hmm. in the business. I didn't know who to look up to. I didn't know what to ask questions to. And once I was able to get to CBS, I actually had a bunch of mentors. And one of them is Leslie Visser, you know, first female inducted into Pro Football Hall of Fame. Um, she's a legend in our, in our industry. And she has really helped me along the way. She's you know, been at CBS forever. She constantly will text me and say like, great job or way to go. And she'll give me tidbits and she just pumps me up. And she has so many, you know, great ideas and wisdom, such wisdom. And um, so she's really a mentor to me. If I can have the longevity that she has in this business, um, then I'd be really lucky. 
Another mentor I have is a director of ours, the only female director at CBS. She was the first person I worked with when I worked auto racing for CBS. And she can be real with me. She can give me the honest opinion and say, you know what, I didn't like what you did here. She's also the director of that We Need to Talk show that I work on. And she really, she is real. She gives me great constructive criticism, which is really important. Um, and Andrea Kramer has become a really big mentor for me also. I work with her and we need to talk, didn't know her before, mm -hmm. also just got elected into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, has a lot of experience. And she gave me great advice going into my first Super Bowl and just said, you know, sit back and take, you know, just a few minutes to look around and realize where you are, what you've accomplished and what you're about to do and take a deep breath and understand it and be thankful. And, and I did that. And so it's, it is so important to have mentors and I hope to mentor, you know, several young men and women in, that want to get into this business because I know how hard it is and it's really important to have that ear and, and to have those people to bounce things off of. Yeah. So the next segment we have is a couple of fans sent us in questions that they wanted to ask you personally. Great. So the first one is from Justin from New York. And he said, as a college football expert and Michigan grad, what do you see as the root issues with Michigan's football problem, football <laughs> program? And is there a coincidence that they haven't won a national championship since you graduated in 1997? It's all my fault. Yes, <laughs> Justin, it is all my fault. Um, I cannot answer that. I don't know what the problem is. We are right there. We are very close. I believe in Harbaugh and I know we are gonna get the job done. So I am really confident, and I think you should be too, Justin. Next one we have is from Eddie M. in New York, and he asked, who, who are you most nervous to interview in your career and why? Well, I think there was a few of them, and I've mentioned them. Um, you know, mm -hmm. definitely, first off, Peyton Manning at the Super Bowl, my first Super Bowl, Super Bowl 50, and you guys use that picture, I think. Yeah. At, um, one of the pictures of me interviewing him. I interviewed him so many times. But interviewing him at Super Bowl 50, when that was his final game, and having to come up with the right wording and the right question and asking him about it, even though he didn't say, yes, I'm retiring, I think that was the most nervous I had ever been. Um, I knew the stage I was on and he's such a good guy, but I just wanted to make sure that I was going to get that question right. Um, certainly, you know, I always talk about interviewing Bill Belichick is it makes me like really nervous. I don't know why um, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, but you know, you want to try and get something that you can use on the air. And so that's really why. And and I never really get nervous interviewing Nick Saban, but you had to make sure you had the right question because He's so smart and you also need to show that you know what you're talking about and he respects you. And if, if you show him that, you know, you're asking the right question at the right time, he will respect you and he'll give you that right answer. And so I think that's so important when it comes to interviewing. And, um, you know, a, a lot of those times in those big moments, that's when you get the most nervous. But if I didn't have those butterflies and I'm in the wrong business and it just means, you know, I'm not enjoying it as much as I used to. Yeah. So next fan question. I think you touched on it a little bit before, but it's from David W. from West Bloomfield, Michigan. And he asked, how did you get involved with sports? Was it your family or were you an athlete growing up? And I think you mentioned you were an athlete. A little bit. Yeah. So I had no brothers and my dad wasn't a huge sports fan. So I have no idea how I became interested in sports, but that's all my parents saw me doing was playing sports and watching sports and talking sports. And I loved it. And yeah, that's why I wanted to get into it. And so it was difficult to be honest as a young girl because all my friends didn't want to talk about it. So I was like, how am I going to get the experience? And, and that's why I went to Michigan. I said, just, you know what? Surround me by big time sports so that I can talk about it, be around it, you know, work for it and, and watch it all day long. And um, I knew, and it, it's just something again, and I'll repeat it, which I said in the beginning of the show, like, it's my passion. And, and if I think if you go into business and do something that you absolutely love, then you never feel like you're working a day in your life. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that's, that's kind of how I knew I was a big, you know, tomboy athlete, love sports, and I never wanted to give it up. So the last fan question we got is from Brian D in Franklin. And he asked, who is your goat, LeBron, Kobe, or Jordan? I'm going to be honest. Mine goes, LeBron at one, oh. Kobe at two, and then Jordan at three. Did he watch the last dance? I mean, come on. It's gotta be Jordan. 
I thank you. Awesome. Thank you. So, you know, I have this debate with my oldest son, Dylan, all the time. And um, he says LeBron and I say Jordan and we go back and forth. And I grew up with LeBron. I mean, I grew up with Jordan, you know, pictures all over my room. Mm -hmm. Like he was the guy I looked up to. I, I always wanted to really to interview him, to be on the sideline. Never got a chance to. Um, had a chance to meet him a few times, but never got the chance to do an interview with him. And um, I mean, just look, look at how he made everyone around him better. Look mm -hmm. at how many championships he won. Look at how hard he worked, not saying that the others didn't. And so mm -hmm. I don't want to take away from LeBron or Kobe because they're amazing in their own right. But if you have to pick one guy, it's definitely for me, Jordan. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Zoe, I don't hear you. I'm sticking with my list. LeBron. Oh, that was your list. Okay. I thought that was the, that's your list. LeBron, Kobe, Jordan, three. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. I thought, I thought we were friends here. <laughs> so we've heard you're a host on the show. We need to talk, which is an all female sports show on CBS. What made you decide to start this program? Yeah, well, I have to give credit to CBS uh, for mm -hmm. putting it together. And it was the idea of several of our executives and, um, Leslie Visser was one of them who had the idea as well and asked me and um, David Burson, our president, one of our co-presidents asked me as well. And, you know, I said, of course, like what better than all female sports show talking sports. And we don't just talk women's sports at all. If anything, we actually talk, you know, men's sports more, mm -hmm. a lot of NFL, a lot of the NBA. We have, what I love about it though, is that there is that mix of women and men's sports and then issues. We talk social issues. We talk, you know, things that are happening now in the sports world. And we have so many different personalities from so many different places. You have, you know, former Olympic athletes and Summer Sanders and Dara Torres who are swimmers. And you have Lisa Leslie and Swin Cash. And then you have broadcasters like Andrea Kramer and myself and mm -hmm. Aditi Kinkabwala and you have, Dana Jacobson, and you have just so many different personalities on this show that ding, bring different perspectives and grew up differently. And we all share it. And, you know, women have a different viewpoint on a lot of things. So why not bring it to sports? Mm -hmm. And I think it's done a tremendous job. It's been around for a long time. We're actually trying to expand the brand even more. Um, I'm really excited to see, you know, where we can take, we need to talk. That's great. So, have you ever thought about switching to a news TV show like CNN or Fox and leaving the sports world? No. You know, I think if there was anything I would ever do, it would probably be like a morning show, you know, just to stay home. But mm -hmm. to be honest, I think if I wanted to stay and not travel anymore, which I'm sure at one point it's going to come to that where I don't want to leave my family every weekend and I don't want to travel um, I think I'd want to do a studio show for CBS, you know, and, and the NFL today would be amazing when if James Brown, you know, doesn't want to do it anymore. He's too good. You know, he's by far, by the way, that one of the best people around. But, you know, I think I think I'd like to try my hand at something else, um, but not news. I love sports. It's fun. It's entertaining. It's news in itself. Mm -hmm. I, I get a, a thrill from the live action. I can't imagine right now not being on the sidelines. People say, do you want to go into the booth and call games? No, I love watching it from the sidelines, mm -hmm. digging for those stories. You really, you know, getting in with the players and doing those interviews. Um, but if I transitioned it at any point, it would probably be to a studio show so I don't have to travel and I could still do interviews, which is what I, I absolutely love to do. Um, and then maybe one day I'll wind up in, you know, the front office and, and helping young broadcasters, um, you know, get on television and get jobs. And, you know, it's something I'm really passionate about also. So what do you think about the upcoming college football season? Do you think it's going to be a sure thing? Oh, I really hope. I think it seems as though, you know, teams and, and athletes are starting to get back on campus. And I, you know, I was just talking about this with friends who have kids going to college next year. I mean, it, they're going to get back on campus. And as long as, you know, COVID could, you know, stay away, we don't see any, you know, flare ups or anything like that. I think they'll play. Um, I don't know whether they'll adjust the season. Um, the fans and we talked about the tailgating and all of that is going to be very interesting to see how yeah. they go about that. But, you know, it's also a financial thing. I mean, they, these universities make a lot of money, you know, hosting these games mm -hmm. and uh, that's really difficult. Yeah. So um, I think everyone wants it to happen. 
I saw that Ward Manuel, he, the AD, he took a pay cut. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They have to right now. Yeah. That was the right thing. So I know that a lot of Michigan fans are watching right now and everyone wants to know if Jim Harbaugh is the guy for Michigan. Do you think he could do it and take us to the next level? I do. Totally believe it. I think he can do it. I think he will. I think we got to give him some time. We've had a lot of changeover, a lot of transition. Um, so many years. Got to get that quarterback position set. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I, you know, I think with Don Brown, I, I have a lot of faith in him. I, Gaddis, I think we have a good crew. I think we've got a good team. Um, and I just think, you know, I think our time is coming. I'm, I'm positive about it. And, uh, you know, it's all go blue for me. I'm always a glass half full kind of person. So. Do you still go to some of the games? Yeah. So if I get a weekend off, which is very rare when you cover the NFL, um, that's the first thing I do is go back to a football game. Uh, my kids always go with my husband. My husband graduated from the University of Michigan also a year before me. So my kids are diehard Michigan fans. And, um, you know, we live in New York so or New Jersey. So it's not the easiest thing to do. And especially with my son's playing sports and everything to get away on a weekend, but we make it a priority. My husband takes them no matter what. And then if I can join them, I go with them. When I did Thursday night football, I had a, a weekend or two off and I would mm -hmm. definitely attend. Um, when I did the SEC, I was able to make it to a game. Right now it's been tough, um, you know, unless we have a weekend off, um, I'm not usually there. You know what I need to happen? So I do Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. always. But when I do Thanksgiving and I'm in Detroit, Michigan's in Ohio. Right. But when I yeah. do Dallas Thanksgiving, Michigan's yeah. at home. I need to switch the years. I need to get back to do Detroit on Thanksgiving when Michigan has the game right. and then be in Dallas when Michigan's in Ohio. So hopefully maybe that'll happen with some, you know, change of the scheduling or the new agreement or something like that. So the, the last question involves another picture that I'm sure a lot of people have seen before because it's a pretty crazy picture but here it is <laughs> this is one of the craziest pictures I've ever seen I mean is that crazy it's crazy so, and the joke is I'm, I don't know why I took my shoes off because it's not <laughs> like that is going to give me any more or less height right <laughs> so do you ever get intimidated when you have to interview bigger and like taller athletes? I don't get intimidated, but I find it very funny. And I think sometimes you have to make a joke out of it mm -hmm. because it is so ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so one year I had to interview Kevin Pitsnoggle. He was with West Virginia actually. And um, he was humongous. And so I remember, and it was like, not after a game, it was a pregame interview. And my producer decided that that's who we're gonna interview. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, really, you're going to have me, can we pick someone who was like smaller? Like, why am I interviewing him? And they're like, don't worry, we'll just put a box and you can stand on the box. And so I did. But meanwhile, I, I like came up to his like, you know, shoulder, his chin, which was totally unrealistic. So it looked like I was basically like six, eight, you know, when he was like seven, one, it was the stupidest thing ever. So uh, I don't get intimidated. I find it very funny. I'm used to everyone just seeing my arm and not my face anymore because that's basically what it is. Um, but, and I, I really, I have to wear heels on a, on a field, not mm -hmm. heels, but like a chunky wedge because I need a little bit of height. People think I'm crazy running around a football field like that or on a basketball court with heels, but I need all the height I can get. So um, it's funny. I always get now, oh, I didn't realize you were so small when everyone meets me in person, but it is what it is. It's part of the job. All right, so that concludes our fourth episode of Front Row Seat. If anyone would like to make a donation to the Detroit Children's Fund, the link is on our website or in our Instagram bio. We have already raised over $4,000. All donations are greatly appreciated. Tracy, thank you so much for this amazing interview. We appreciate you taking the time out of your night for this. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and stay tuned for the next episode. Anything else you want to add, Tracy? You guys are awesome, by the way. I love what you're doing. I would be a guest anytime. Keep it up. Keep up the great work and go blue. Go blue. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for coming. You got it.